Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Don Ma in for Stefania. Here are today's top stories. Good news for House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy today as he inches closer to getting the votes to become the next Speaker of the House. It's been two years since the January 6 Capitol breach and public opinion about it hasn't really changed. We review what the polls show. Monetary donations toward political causes. Newly disclosed documents indicate that philanthropist George Soros donated much more money than previously known. Updates from a man who refused to leave a Loudoun County School Board meeting. 18 months ago, he was convicted of trespassing, an appeals court now says he had a right to be there. And Buffalo Bills safety Jamar Hamlin made a surprise call to his teammates today. Meanwhile, the league now seeks a possible neutral site to play the AFC title game. Kevin McCarthy is inching his way closer to holding the Speaker's gavel for the 118th Congress. It could be as early as tonight. He's won over most of the 20 members who've opposed him all week, but there's still more work to do to gain the last few votes needed. And now joining us live is Melina Weiskup from Capitol Hill. Now, Melina, tell us what's changed from yesterday with regards to those opposing McCarthy. Hi, Don. Yeah, so it seems like a lot has changed since last night. One of the most important, of course, being that for the first time this week, Leader McCarthy has gained more votes than the Democrat nominee, Hakeem Jeffries. So all week, McCarthy has been sitting at around 200 votes, not budging much past that. And just this morning, during that first round of voting today, uh, fifth, around 15 members who were opposing McCarthy all week flipped and threw their support behind him. Uh, the sim- a similar result we saw after that second round of voting today and right after that second round, McCarthy came out with confidence that he will secure the gavel just hours from now. Here's a look at what he said. I think you saw we made some very good progress. Uh, we'll come back tonight. And I believe at that time we'll have the votes. Well, caving to the far right is getting a bill 72 hours in advance, the far right is having single subject um, bills and germaneness, the far right, is having amendments on the floor and being able to, with, when bills come up, offer amendments. I mean, that's not far right, that's common sense. So that was a conversation I had with Representative Ralph Norman just moments ago, kind of pushing back against that argument that by McCarthy making agreements with the group of those 20 members who were opposing him, uh, he was essentially caving to the far right. Now, Ralph Norman has been one of those members in those negotiation talks all week. Um, So he has been pushing for a number of these rules changes. And how did we get here? How did they how did they come to this framework of an agreement? Well, this has been an ongoing effort from Ralph Norman and from all the other 20 members who have been opposing McCarthy. Well, most of the other members who have been opposing McCarthy, um, they wanted to do a number of things with regards to rules changes, such as restoring the motion to vacate the chair to its original status, meaning that the speaker is held more accountable by every single member. Um, there's also now some agreement with how to handle budget issues. Uh, that's also been one argument from this group of 20. I, I believe that you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, so they all say they got a, they have a, now a framework for how to move forward here, and that they trust that McCarthy will be held accountable to this framework. Um, you know, after that group, uh, you know, uh, flipped their votes today, they came out and explained to reporters exactly why they flipped their votes. One of those be, one of those reasons being that they believe that you know this has shown the American people what a true deliberative process looks like, and other members who. Not, were not, who were uh, constantly supporting McCarthy throughout this whole week, also said that they actually support the efforts from these 20 members and they support these rules changes. We haven't heard any negative uh, speak from Republicans who have, you know, been supporting McCarthy all week. So that's uh, something very interesting. They all said they believe that this is, that we'll, we'll turn, the Republican Party will be better off for it after it's all over. So as for where we are right now, the House has adjourned until 10 p.m. That group of Republicans who originally opposed McCarthy but just today flipped their vote to support McCarthy are now working to flip those last few votes, those six holdout votes um, that right now is 
holding back, uh, which, uh, with holding back McCarthy's uh, ability to gain the gavel, they're now working to try to get some, uh, change some of their minds and hopefully secure that position for him later this evening. So they will come back at 10 and we will know more by that time. Don, we'll toss it back to you. All right, thanks for the updates, Melina. And Elon Musk also weighed in on the race for House Speaker. He tweeted his support for McCarthy yesterday, asking, quote, if not McCarthy, then seriously, who? And also today marks the two-year anniversary of the January 6th Capitol breach. President Biden handed out medals to election officials and police officers, calling them heroes. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Marking the second anniversary of the January 6th Capitol breach. On January the 6th, our democracy was attacked. President Biden holds a ceremony at the White House, honoring members of the Capitol Police who defended the building on that day. You held the line that day, and what was on the line was our democracy. For the first time in his presidency, Biden presents the Presidential Citizens Medals. Today, 12 individuals, including officers and election workers, were given the award. America is a land of laws and not chaos, and history will remember your names. Over the past two years, Biden has often used the events of January 6 to target what he calls mega Republicans. He also made it a central political theme ahead of the midterms. Democracy is in the ballot for all of us. The House January 6th committee, which is now disbanded, largely blamed former President Trump for inciting what happened on January 6th. The House Republicans released its own January 6th report in December, suggesting, quote, leadership and law enforcement failures within the U.S. Capitol left the complex vulnerable. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. In his speech, Biden also linked the death of Capitol Police Officer William Evans to, quote, threats by these sick insurrectionists. But Evans was killed three months after the breach by a man who rammed a car into him. The suspect was a self-described supporter of the Nation of Islam, a controversial black nationalist movement. Media reports show no clear link between the suspect and the events of January 6. During the past year, Quinnipiac University conducted a series of polls probing feelings about January 6. One question was whether or not former President Trump committed any crimes related to the event. NTD's Arlene Richards brings us the results. It's been two years since the controversial Capitol breach played out on Americans' TV screens on January 6, and Americans are still divided on whether or not former President Trump committed a crime. Think Tank Brookings recently compiled results of a series of Quinnipiac polls that asked, how much responsibility does Donald Trump bear for January 6? The university conducted three polls in January, June, and December of 2022. In January, 43% of those polled believed Trump had a lot to do with the incident, with 18% saying he had some responsibility and 36% saying not much or none. The results barely changed in December as the January 6 hearings were winding down. In June, when the committee launched its first public hearing, 25% of those polled said Trump had no responsibility for the breach, up from 20 in January. By December, that number dropped to 21%. Many expected the hearings would change public opinion, but the polls show Americans remain divided along party lines on this issue. Americans are also divided on how serious the incident was. In January 2022, 50% said the incident was an attack on democracy, while 44% said it's time to move on. The numbers were about the same in December at 54% and 41%. Since December, the committee has ended its investigation and published an 845-page report that blames Trump for the Capitol breach. Meanwhile, Trump's legal woes continue to mount. On Thursday, the estate of Brian Sicknick, a Capitol Police officer who died after responding to the breach, sued Trump and two others for their alleged roles in encouraging it. The lawsuit also alleges a conspiracy, negligence, and assault. Arlene Richards, NTD News. But despite that, former President Trump sounded a note of optimism today, writing on Truth Social, quote, Good things will be soon happening for the Republican Party, and 2024 will be a monster, in a good way, of course. 
Newly disclosed tax documents indicate that billionaire George Soros donated much more money to political causes than previously thought. The records say his contributions amount to over half a billion dollars, with some donations from his nonprofit going to so called election reform groups. Philanthropist George Soros donated $170 million to Democratic candidates and campaigns during the 2022 midterms. Now CNBC says it's obtained tax filings showing that he also quietly donated around $200 million to advocacy organizations, ballot initiatives, and like-minded charities in 2021. Soros allegedly made these contributions through the Open Society Policy Center, an organization he funds. That organization allegedly donated another $138 million to advocacy groups and causes in 2020. The newly disclosed amounts would bring his total donations to political causes since January 2020 to around a half billion dollars. Some donations from the Open Society Policy Center went to a group called the 1630 Fund. This group's president says it aims to fight back against an extremist right-wing agenda and election deniers who threaten our democracy. Donations also went to similar groups like Fair Fight Action, which was founded to fight alleged voter suppression. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. And now turning to the jobs market. The U.S. economy added 223,000 jobs in December, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The leisure and hospitality sector added the most jobs, followed by healthcare and construction. The unemployment rate also fell to 3.5% last month, matching its lowest level in 50 years. Workers as well got somewhat of a pay raise over the month. Hourly average earnings increased 0.3% for the month. However, wage growth slowed year over year. Also, more people entered into the workforce. The labor force participation rate ticked up a tenth of a percent. In total, the economy added nearly 4.5 million jobs in all of 2022. It was the second best year for the labor market in over 60 years. And over to California, the storm on Thursday knocked down structures and flooded roads. In one Bay Area city, a family had to relocate after a tree crushed their home. Wind and rain brought down trees on this apartment complex in the East Bay city of Oakland. Victoria James said she thought it was an earthquake at first. Um, I was in the kitchen getting ready to start dinner. Everything shook and went black. Like the whole unit just like shook. I thought it was earthquake. So I ran to the back with the kids. We all met in the hallway. Um, and then it, it, I was like waiting for aftershock because I really thought it was earthquake. My neighbor started screaming for me to come out and I looked out the window and saw the tree in front of my daughter's window right there. So it was a live wire um, from pg and So he said, just come out, get, get you and the kids out. So we just left what we had on our back and left. But there's big holes in the ceiling, like in my bedroom, the living room. In the kitchen, for sure, I saw that tree trunks came into the apartment. So it's flooded in there right now. It's definitely flooded. Officials had ordered evacuations in high-risk coastal areas Wednesday and warned residents to hunker down at home in anticipation of flooded roads, toppled trees, and other risks. I mean, I I broke down. You know, I tried to stay strong around the kids because I don't want them to see me upset, but... It's hard. I mean, we don't have anything but what's on our back. Like, kids don't have shoes on or nothing. So, you know, food is in the house. It's hard. The storm is the latest of three atmospheric river storms in the last week to reach the drought-stricken state. It dumped rain in parts of the San Francisco Bay Area, where the region had been under flood warnings. In Southern California, forecasters said the storm should peak Thursday. Santa Barbara and Ventura counties are likely to see the most rain. According to PowerOutage.us, more than 180,000 homes and businesses were without power in California early Thursday. Officials say the storms won't be enough to officially end the state's ongoing drought, now entering its fourth year. Atmospheric rivers, named by researchers in the 1990s, occur globally but are especially significant on the U.S. West Coast. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, these storms make up 30 to 50 percent of annual precipitation. And what became of the man who was convicted of trespassing at a Virginia school board meeting? NTD's Arlene Richards caught up with him, and he's celebrating what he calls a victory for free speech as, as his conviction is overturned. This is 
In this footage posted by Reuters correspondent Gabriella Border, John Tiggis, a resident of Loudoun County, became the face of a heated school board meeting. Hundreds of parents turned out to complain about the school's transgender policy, which they blamed for the sexual assault of a female student. The superintendent ended the public comment session early and called the sheriff for assistance. Tiggis refused to leave. He was convicted for trespassing. Uh, I understand that there was a hearing recently in which you were found not guilty for trespassing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, so I was found not guilty for trespassing at a public school board meeting. And it's a misdemeanor, it may not seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal for the First Amendment and big deal for people here locally who felt like they'd been squashed by the school board, by the sheriff, by the county um, commonwealth attorney, and really by government in general. He appealed the conviction and said the case revolved around three things. One, whether or not I was there in good faith. Two, did the superintendent have the authority to clear the room? And then lastly, was the First Amendment itself at stake? Was it a squashing of the First Amendment? An appellate judge overruled decisions by two prior judges and said Tiggis had a right to speak and assemble. Sheriff Scott Chapman's office told NTD in an email that the earlier conviction indicates that his deputies acted appropriately, but added, I believe in the criminal justice system and respect the decision of the judge. In December 2022, the county superintendent, Scott Ziegler, was fired after a special grand jury report said he lied about a rape committed by a transgender student. But Tiggis said the last 18 months haven't been easy. He says he was put on a watch list and branded as a terrorist. Just completely out of the blue. I was accused of not uh, masking in between bites while eating a sandwich. And they hauled me off the airplane. The Portland police officers pulled me aside and I had to fight a $14,000 fine for six months. In October 2021, Attorney General Merrick Garland called for the FBI to address threats of violence against school personnel, calling it domestic terrorism. Tiggis said parents are more afraid to speak up, but he's committed to serving his community. We encourage that now. Friendships, family, and our faith as the bedrock of everything else. Out of that freedom flows. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Don. Good news from the NFL today as Bill's safety, DeMar Hamlin, is now breathing on his own and is able to talk again after having his breathing tube removed, according to his agent. Hamlin even made a surprise appearance in a team meeting via video conference Friday morning, according to head coach Sean McDermott. McDermott said he kept it a secret from the team, only announcing he had a special treat in store for them. The 24-year-old Hamlin was still listed in critical condition though Thursday while in the ICU just three days after going to cardiac arrest and being resuscitated on the field against the Bengals. The NFL has since announced that they will not resume the game and will instead have a neutral site for the AFC Championship game if the seating of the teams playing was affected by the canceled game. Now essentially this impacts not only the Bills and Bengals, but also the Chiefs and Ravens. The Chiefs, because they're currently the top seed, but could have lost the top spot to the winner of the Bills-Bengals game, and the Ravens, because they could have won the division over Cincinnati if they beat them on Sunday. So if the Chiefs and Bills both win or tie this weekend, and then meet in the title game, it'll be at a neutral site. They would also be at a neutral site if they both lose, but Baltimore beats or ties the Bengals on Sunday. If the Chiefs and Bills both lose and Cincinnati wins, then a Chiefs-Bills or Chiefs-Bengals matchup would also be at a neutral site, which has yet to be chosen. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, the NBA has 11 games planned, featuring the West leading Denver Nuggets hosting the Cleveland Cavs. And finally, for you hockey fans, the NHL has six games on tap, including the three-time defending East champion Tampa Bay Lightning playing at the Winnipeg Jets. And that's it for your sports news today. Back to you, Don.
Thanks, Dave. And coming up, dozens of people are dead after the arrest of a drug lord in Mexico. Shootouts erupted throughout the state after the manhunt. And fighting continues in Ukraine after the start of a proposed ceasefire. The ceasefire was declared by Moscow but rejected by Kyiv. That and more after this short break. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your support by bringing you the pillow that started it all. Get my standard my pillow, regularly $49.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Just like all of you, I've tried every pillow out there, and none of them worked. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts your exact individual needs, helps keep your neck aligned, and it holds its shape all night long, regardless of your sleep position. So you get the best sleep of your life. Because it works, we've sold over 70 million My Pillows, and now I'm bringing them to you for the lowest price ever. Go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code, and you'll get my standard My Pillow for only $19.98. For a more custom fit, my Premium Queen for only $27.98. Or my premium king, only $34.98. My 60-day money-back guarantees it'll be the most comfortable pillow you'll ever own. Turning now to international news. Dozens of people are dead after authorities arrested a cartel boss in Mexico. Shootings erupted across the region after law enforcement hunted down the son of drug lord El Chapo. A wave of violence swept through northern Mexico on Thursday after law enforcement arrested Ovidio Guzman, a key figure of the Sinaloa cartel and son of drug baron Joaquin Guzman, known as El Chapo. Security forces clashed with cartel gunmen. At least 29 people have reportedly died, 10 police officers and 19 suspected gang members. Witness video showed vehicles on fire and passengers on a commercial flight diving for cover as gunshots rang out at the city's international airport. Here you can see passengers kneeling between seats as the plane still was on the airport's runway. A passenger said flight attendants announced that the plane had been shot at. The U.S. State Department on Thursday advised people not to travel to the state of Sinaloa, which is where the violence took place. Those Americans who were in uh, Sinaloa, and we strongly encourage them to monitor local news, uh, to follow emergency instructions provided by local authorities. Ovidio Guzman emerged as a leader in the Sinaloa cartel after his father's arrest in 2016. The Sinaloa cartel is one of the world's foremost narcotics groups. His capture comes ahead of President Biden's visit to Mexico next week. It isn't clear if Ovidio will be extradited to the United States like his father, who is serving a life sentence at one of the most secure U.S. federal prisons. An artillery fire could be heard from the front line in Ukraine after the official start of a unilateral ceasefire declared by Moscow. Kiev had rejected the ceasefire as a ploy. The Russian Defense Ministry on Friday accused the Ukrainian army of shelling Russian positions in Ukraine, despite Moscow's unilateral ceasefire. A Defense Ministry spokesperson said Russian troops had returned the fire. In a surprise last-minute announcement on Thursday, Russian President Putin ordered his troops to observe a two-day ceasefire from Friday to run through the Russian Orthodox Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. The Kremlin said Putin had responded to a request from the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. One witness in the Russian-occupied regional capital Donetsk, close to the front, described outgoing artillery fired from pro-Russian positions on the city's outskirts after the truce was meant to take effect. In the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, these children, dressed up as carol singers, sought shelter following a post-ceasefire air alert. Before the deadline early on Friday, Russian shelling killed one rescue worker and injured four others in the southern Ukrainian city of Kherson. That's according to the regional governor. Reuters could not immediately verify this claim. President Volodymyr Zelensky has rejected the truce as a ploy for Russia to buy time. They now want to use Christmas as a cover, albeit briefly, to stop the advances of our boys in Donbas and bring equipment ammunitions and mobilized troops closer to our positions. 
He said there could be no truce until Russia withdraws its troops from occupied land. Meanwhile, Germany is ramping up military support for Kiev. Berlin said it would deliver around 40 tanks to Ukraine before the end of March. It follows similar pledges by the United States and France. The move marks another notable shift forward in Germany's weapons deliveries to Ukraine and followed a phone call between Chancellor Olaf Scholz and US President Joe Biden. Scholz has sometimes hesitated before supplying powerful weapons for fear of risking direct conflict with Russia. Berlin also said a Patriot anti-aircraft missile system from army stocks will also be delivered to Ukraine in the first quarter. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Don Ma. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.